Hey guys, I'm finally sharing my church hurt story, where I've been, where I am today. I asked Kevin from Beyond the Fundamentals to please kind of do an interview style with me so that he could draw out through questions and um, just, I don't know, just natural conversation. Uh, some of the things that I felt and, and walk through during this last two years. Um, and so we, uh, did a live interview last night on his channel and now I'm sharing the video here for you guys to check out. I will probably do a follow-up live on my channel Q and A for you guys. If there's anything that you want to hear more about, anything that I didn't elaborate enough on, or anything I didn't touch on at all that you're curious about, it will probably be the last time I talk about this uh, in a formal video. But I did want to open the floor for questions from my people. So uh, I hope you enjoy the interview with Kevin. I had a great time. I have a lot of fun just chatting with him naturally, and. Um, I hope that it encourages you and that it accomplishes what I hope that it accomplishes for so many. I have been incredibly encouraged and strengthened by hearing other people's testimonies who have gone through similar things, even if the scenarios or the situations totally different. The emotions all seem to be very similar. And of course, some people have it way worse, like Jehovah's Witness or Mormons, but it's still incredible how much overlap there is, how much, how much similarity there is. So I really hope that it encourages you and blesses you and it gives you a little window into what I've been through in the last year and a half that has kind of altered my channel a little bit, but I feel like I'm back, you guys. I'm so thankful for the Lord's healing and for time and just the way he's provided so much for me to be able to grow in strength and press forward and move on and to do it in love which is the best part so i hope you enjoy leave some uh questions for me if you have any in the comments and when i do the live i'll probably start with answering those and then whoever tunes in live can ask on the spot so enjoy the video god bless you guys and thanks again for everything welcome to beyond the fundamentals it's good to see you here I uh, see a lot of people in the chat already, and today we have a special guest, guest Miss Alana, Alana L. Hey. She has her own channel as well. So um, if you would take a second and uh, introduce yourself, Alana. Hey, everybody. Yes, I'm Alana, and I, um, I've i been on your channel twice now, right, Kevin? This is my third yeah, time. Yeah, I think twice, and then, uh, mm -hmm. we, and then we did a collab with Layton and Jason after the right. big debate there and then That's we right. all got to meet in person back on the 24th of february which was a lot of fun it was wonderful yeah i'm happy to be here today i i have a channel like kevin said my channel is mostly focused on marriage and homemaking i do some parenting and homeschooling stuff and just homesteading things as well i would love for you all to check it out and if you are here from my channel thanks for being here i know it's an odd time but and I really appreciate your support. I've been brainstorming for a while, uh, just trying to decide when it would be, when I would be ready re really to share my church hurt story. I hate using words like that because it feels so, I don't know, uh, millennial, but it's just Yeah, true. you don't want to smell sour grapes or something like that. Yeah, and so, I don't know. I just feel ready. And I thought it would be really neat to do it with Kevin because I feel like I've learned a lot about not just myself, but also just the psychological effects of some going through something like this, that it's can happen to a person. And I feel mm -hmm. like him asking questions will help me share more freely and just better about those specific things. So thanks for having me today. Yeah, thanks for it. coming on. It's it's a privilege to have you on, Alana. As every time your name comes up on the channel, we immediately get flooded with several comments talking about how they love your channel, they love your testimony, they love watching you. A lot of people look up to you. So the the idea to me that you can first of all, it's an honor and privilege that you would want to have this conversation with me. So thanks for that for that privilege for and sure. um the 
<clears throat> one of the things that stands out to me is the ability to go through something that is very trying and very troubling and you you're coming out the other side without resentment without bitterness is far as i can tell with your eyes still fixed on jesus still fixed on trying to serve the lord as best as you can the best way you know how so a lot of people have they encounter something negative and they just leave christianity altogether and you are not letting a negative event dissuade you from keeping your eyes on christ um you may i'll let you put it in your own words but i would i would suspect that you would describe your journey as your eyes being more on christ than they were before so it it is a privilege here to have you here so thanks for coming on and if just for just to orient everybody real quick 30 second elevator speech on how you mm -hmm. became a christian mm -hmm. and how you got started serving god in a church okay i became a christian around 16 or 17 and I had heard about the Lord throughout my life. I never really heard the gospel till I was 13 or so, but I did go to several retreats and just had more and more exposure leading up to my sophomore year in high school. And it was around that time I attended a church and heard the gospel, believed, and my life pretty much changed forever after that. And I wasn't brought up in a non-Christian home, but I, because I heard about God, but it wasn't like we're raising our children. We were not at church. We were not, we didn't mention the Lord every day. I didn't see um, an emphasis on living for the Lord. So it's a few differences, but I did grow up in a loving, loving home that did believe in God. Yeah. Yeah. So when you started, give me the timeline quickly of, or not too quickly, just uh the timeline of when you got saved, like put the events in order mm -hmm, of sure. when you got saved, when you got married, when you started having kids, when you started going to this church, that, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Sure. So I got saved 16, 17 within three years. I started listening to John MacArthur on the radio, slowly became a Calvinist, but I didn't know the title yet until I was mm -hmm. 22. Um, I moved to Tennessee came to a, a Christian university where the big debate was Calvinist or Arminian. And at that point is when I kind of realized, oh, I'm a Calvinist, but I didn't even know mm -hmm. until I was there. And shortly after that, within two years, I married Hector, which we knew each other in Florida. We just went several ways for like a year and then came mm -hmm. back together, got mm -hmm. married. And at that point, we were both John MacArthur followers and Calvinists. And um, pretty quickly, within two months of living in Tennessee, found our Calvinist church. And we chose it because it was Calvinist. So that's why oh, wow. we chose it. Okay, yes. so you you went into this church knowing full well you were intentionally mm -hmm. trying to be at a Calvinist church. Yes. And okay. it was very small at that time with several people in the same season of life that we were in. So it was just like an immediate, very exciting time of life, you know, just all of us starting off and, you know, we all eventually had our kids together and then the church grew and grew, but that core group, it was very, very fun time in life. It, it sounds endearing. It almost sounds mm -hmm. like a, uh, like a sitcom that you would love to watch, <laughs> you know, Everybody, mm -hmm. it sounds like there's a, a feeling of community, a feeling of togetherness, mm -hmm. uh, being on a co-journey with not only your husband and uh and and a few other families as well so and i've met yeah. hector mm -hmm. and uh, i gotta say you're a lucky lady too. thank uh, you <laughs> thank you usually that compliment goes the other way around that's why it's funny to me oh no um, everyone I've tells everyone tells me constantly how lucky i am that's an <laughs> ongoing joke between hector and i i'm like another person telling me how blessed i am i'm like what about you <laughs> but we just mess around with that all the old ladies tell him how me how blessed i am <laughs> <laughs> no you guys are uh, i'm used to hearing it no i really enjoyed meeting you guys in person it's a shame you guys don't live closer so i know so um you're there okay so walk us through like what what happens at this well 
I, I, you're there for 17 years. So mm -hmm. what, everything was fine. Everything was great. What, I mean, yeah. What was the, uh, what was the odor that caught your attention and caused you to be like, er, what, what is this? Yeah. Um, everything was great for 17 years. I mean, happy, wonderful friendships, fun, best people I ever met in my life. Like just everything about it was wonderful. And Never had any issues, no drama, no gossip, no red flags. I thought right. it was a very healthy place. I loved it. And it wasn't until my kids were six and seven, I started reading the Bible to them. And I just remember this one little moment and I, I didn't make anything of it. I just moved past it that I was reading to them from the gospel of Matthew. And I remember reading and thinking, this sounds like salvation is available to everyone, but I was just in a busy season. I didn't give it much thought. I didn't stay and investigate. I just moved on. Hmm. And it wasn't until many years later, um, I guess November of 2019, that it was the first time I was ever challenged on Calvinism. So did, that, did that thing, whatever you read in Matthew, did it kind of brew in your head for a while? I mean, did your mind go back to it every now and then and be like, huh, what about this? Not like a little. Unfortunately, no. no. Like a pebble in my shoe. Nope. Yeah. That, because. I didn't want to say that phrase. I've heard it so much recently. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, I'm the kind of person that I will not ignore the pebble in my shoe. So it really did just pass through my mind and I didn't think about it again. Uh, if I had, if it did linger, I wouldn't have just let it stay there unaddressed. I would have pursued something. So I, I just know there's that, you know, cognitive dissonance. The season of my life was very busy raising little kids. I just didn't make time for it. I didn't even think of it again, wow. to be honest. Yeah. So then 2019. So then fast forward. Yeah. All the way to 2019. Uh, so when was that again? The Matthew part that that was. It was uh, probably when Ivan was around six, so probably around 2015, 16. Oh, wow. So we're talking like mm -hmm. something sitting there for a few years. Yeah, maybe for 2014 or so, 14 or 15. Yeah, yeah I, I didn't even think of it again. But so, in uh, hindsight is when I remembered that moment. Yeah, I kind of want to like, you know, I tell people sometimes we, we have this idea that if we have the right skills like if i take the right biblical interpretation techniques mm -hmm. to the bible then i should be able to arrive at the correct meaning right now like we have mm -hmm. that idea and it's really people don't know that they're they're pursuing cartesian philosophy when they do that mm -hmm. but in reality it seems that it seems that things kind of have to sit for a while and marinate mm -hmm. and you have to transform into them like you kind of have to grow into the hand-me-downs that your sibling mm -hmm. leaves for you something like that does that make sense sure so yes. i think i think some things do take months and years to kind of brew for a while before you're ready for them like mm -hmm. with all of us sure yes well you know i i did share a video with my friend lonnie who was the friend i knew her through juice plus probably around 20 maybe 2012, 2013, around that time. Mm -hmm. And she and I met in person for coffee when she was coming through my town once. We did business together. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, you have a Juice Plus background too. I, I have a I Juice Plus that. story, that's right. <laughs> that's right. And then I didn't see her again for many years, but we stayed in touch. She started, her, she got married, she started her family. She was a YouTube uh, subscriber that I got to meet in person and work with. and. Many years later, I posted something online, which caused her to challenge me on Calvinism specifically. And my first response to her was, I'm Calvinist to the bone, which is hilarious to me now. But we talked for <laughs> what days. What an egoic statement. I know. <laughs> oh, well, we talked for days and weeks. And that conversation is what those many conversations is what put the pebble in my shoe that I could not uh -huh. ignore. And that's when I went on my personal journey, revisiting everything and just going down tulip and sovereignty and the order of salvation and all those things, reprobation, all the pieces of this doctrine. And I came out the other side, not satisfied, not convinced and realizing, okay, now we're like starting from ground zero here. Um, and it was exciting. It was an exciting time. 
uh, but also a little bit scary. I didn't really know what we were going to do. Uh, thankfully, Hector was not far behind. I mean, yeah, that we was going to be my next question. Where yeah. is Hector with all this? Are y'all are y'all in the mm-hmm. boxing ring every night while this is mm-hmm. going on? Thankfully, no. <laughs> <laughs> thankfully, I mean, we did. There was a few conversations where he was like, "Back off," you know. No, like we cannot do this today because I was like, ah, like freaking out. <laughs> and um, I don't know, maybe a week or so of going through the scriptures together. Uh, we just both love the Lord. I, I feel like both of us, I don't know, I always say this, and maybe the words don't truly come across as what I mean by it, but I feel like our love for the Lord is what made it easy Mm. to walk away from this Mm -hmm. to see it and to stay together through it you know like if i let this go god's still there yes yeah it was it was not this we can't let go we can't let go and and then you being able to see eye to eye in it and walk through it out of it together um and i just really see that that it was because we were both so devoted to the lord we've seen him change our whole lives we came to christ late in life so um we he changed our lives so thankfully we were on the same page and we you know we were like we can't talk about this and we didn't for a while we did not talk about it probably till the next spring to any friends april so you like you didn't talk about it with each other either with each other with my mom and with my friend Lonnie, I spoke to her and then no close friends from our church till April or May, the following year, COVID year. Yeah, um, yeah. And that was not how I expected or Hector, you know, like when something drastic happens in your life, what do you do? You talk to your friends, right? Yeah. You talk to your closest friends. Hey, listen to what's going on. Listen to what's happening. And I did not anticipate the, the, just how unwelcome the conversation was and, and everybody reacted differently, of course, but in a nutshell, it was not a conversation that we were going to be allowed to have. So from there, I mean, not much happened. We talked to some friends and then we realized this is over. We're not going to talk anymore to friends. We ha- we talked to the elders cause they found out. Because people went out. to them and told on us. Yeah. T- <laughs> uh, so they, they found out, yes, as if it's something so bad and wrong. And um, which is fine. I don't mind talking so, to them. Can we pause there just for a second? You said mm-hmm. this phrase as if it's something bad and wrong. Mm-hmm. Was there like a, did you sense a moralistic kind of weight with which this whole issue was being treated by all those involved? Um. I think the moralistic, tell me if this falls into the, under this category. I, I, it was frowned upon that we didn't talk to the elders. Why, why did you wait so long before talking to the elders? And I, my feelings to that is because I didn't want to talk to them. I wanted to do this on my own. Yeah. You know, like well, I don't think I did anything wrong. It seems like there's a presumption behind that question of if they could have caught you earlier, they could have stopped you from turning. Mm-hmm. Something exactly. like that. <laughs> that is my, without, you know, drawing any conclusions, that is what I tend to think to, for sure. Uh, yeah. Because it's dangerous and uh, they could have, you know, tried to sway us to stay in the same mindset. But yeah, I so didn't what's want the danger? That. What's the danger? See, I hear that a lot too. People mm-hmm. like, they, they hear that you're on some kind of growth journey and they're like, oh, this is dangerous. I'm like, what's the, what What are we talking about here? Are we talking about burning your feet or going too fast mm-hmm. on the highway? What's the danger here? Probably um, falling away. I, I, I don't know because I, you don't believe a Christian can fall away. So I, I don't know what the danger is. I don't know. I think it's just a way to try to control someone and to not stir the waters and to not, you know, it's, <laughs> It's um don't rock the boat. Yes, don't rock the boat. We were we were considered low maintenance members, me and Hector. Right. We've never caused any drama in 17 years. We've never had any issues with anybody. And this was <laughs> like tidal wave. 
know, now you become like the problem. The biggest problem. So like you're no, you're no longer a uh, an interchangeable part for the car. You're no longer you mm -hmm. you know you're now a yeah. cog in the machine that's messing things up. Yes, and I damage control. That's the word I'm looking for. So there uh, was I definitely saw that happening. I'm like, what is going on? Why can't we talk? You know, like there's nothing wrong with this. So like and damage control is like a narrative control kind of thing. That happened too, but I would say I'm like sure what's, what's the difference between damage control and narrative control? Um narrative control, I would say is the story behind the Lagaris is, you know, like this is what's happening with them without people coming and hearing it directly from us, you know? So that would be the narrative. Mm -hmm. I heard several times people say things like, nobody wants to debate you. And I, I, what I would think was, oh, that's the narrative going around. <laughs> that okay. all I, I want to do is debate. debate. Either. Exactly. I don't <laughs> want to debate either. But it was so obvious. Okay, that's the picture being painted, you know? And then the damage control, I think, was um, more evident later, way down later, when I made my videos after we left, uh, I just heard that people were like, go to this Sunday school class. It's okay if you don't go to that one. You need to go to Theology 101 or whatever, the Theology 1. Um, even if you think you understand the sovereignty of God, come and redo this class. And it's oh, like, So they're trying to patch wow. things up. Yes. Like Band-Aids. Mm -hmm. Stop the bleeding. Yes. I, I And, you know, I'm sure there's more that I don't know about. Um, but those are some things that got to me that I heard about. And so, so they were kind of worried, I guess, that there would be some momentum with your departure that maybe other people mm -hmm. would follow suit. So that might be the damage control portion. Yes. And then the narrative control is they get to tell their own story about it. And discredit me, make me sound as stupid. I, it's like, people online influenced her like what no they didn't actually <laughs> my friend that i talked to challenged me and i went and did my own research and i deliberately did not go online because i didn't want to do the same thing on the other side i didn't want to just go to people and hear all people's opinions on the other side and just take those for myself i wanted to form my own based on what i saw in scripture which is what i had not done before you know yeah. so i didn't want to just repeat the same mistake so no i didn't go online no online isn't what even challenged me initially with calvinism but think I about that though why why is you notice like that there's there's lots of things online and if something is online that doesn't make it discredited so mm -hmm. you notice how there's like a there's like an overtone of non non-credibility just by saying the phrase online without mm -hmm. even checking who it's with sure yep. i mean what what if like yeah i became a calvinist because of listening to john MacArthur online mm -hmm. or you know what i mean what's the difference between right. i mean information is information and so yes. that sounds like there's a genetic fallacy built into the accusation there mm -hmm. i think the attempt is to make me sound foolish i don't want to say stupid because it's not ignorant that they're trying to make me sound it's foolish look right, how foolish yep. she's being look how erratic or whatever she's being she keeps apologizing one friend in fact i told this friend this two weeks ago i talked to him and i told him no you've never hurt my feelings or offended me in any way except for that one time that you told me i was like a child in a house filled with glass objects dropping a bouncing ball and breaking things all the time and saying oops sorry over and over i was like that was pretty offensive but these are the kind of comments <laughs> that i was offensive. told <laughs> how <laughs> can you say that to someone you know it's like if i apologize oh you're like a child in a house bouncing a ball that keeps breaking stuff if i don't apologize you're proud. It's like you can't, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Like, that's you can't exactly win. right. So, you can't win. I mean, if, if you don't mind me just volunteering this, you, you come across to me as a very conscientious person. In other words, mm -hmm. it sounds like you take, if you're going to spend your attention or time on something, it sounds like you're going to take that very seriously. And so, yes. <laughs> I do not take you as the kind of person to be 
be a troublemaker or to just frivolously go down some path without taking it very, very seriously. I think that's that I think that's obvious pretty quickly after being exposed to you, after listening to you, talking with you. It doesn't take long to understand that that's who you are. And so the idea that <laughs> the idea that someone's treating you like this is I don't know, it's not in keeping with the Alana that I know that I would suspect they also knew Mm -hmm. they're, they're out of integrity with the you that they Mm -hmm. knew in order to say things like that. I agree. I have thought that same thing. It's like, you know, me guys, come on, you know, me, (laughs) I do think there's a strategic issue. Like you, because you're conscientious, like you want, you genuinely want to do the right thing you you would apologize for various things and then mm-hmm. there was like some back and forth about they wanted you to apologize it's almost like they're wanting you to capitulate to a certain thing and mm-hmm. you're like well and the problem with these things is that you you're never going to come into an encounter or undergo something and come out with completely clean hands or feel completely clean so you're always like oh maybe i didn't do that absolutely perfectly but as soon as you in this kind of scenario, when when an ideologue is involved, or when ideologues are involved, and that would be basically any mammon church, any stage three church people, then an apology of any kind is going to be like blood in the water that's going to draw in all the sharks. Mm-hmm. They're going to see that as a weakness, and they're going to pounce on it, and they're going to, oh, she actually feels like she's sorry for something. We need to exploit that. And mm-hmm. like nuzzle ourself in there, that kind of thing i don't know yes i sensed that definitely come come to my office i'm like no way to what to just sit there and like be told how bad i am like i'm not gonna go sit in the office and yeah and you know that those kinds of things i could catch beforehand and and didn't do anything i didn't put myself in any position i didn't knowingly want to be in so the times the times i apologized so pretty much after I left, like I was there, we didn't talk about anything the rest of our time that we were there. We stayed about two and a half years and everything stayed the same. We stopped going, we kept going to small group. We kept hanging out with all the so same you went people. Two and a half years after yes. you have left Calvinism and you yes. stay with the in group for two and a half years. Yes. And it was fear driven a hundred percent. Okay. I was wow. like, what are we going to do if we leave, you know? what are we going to do? And this isn't the first time in my life that that kind of fear uh, is evident in myself. When I was in high school, I was in a horrible relationship and I knew it and I didn't even want to be with the guy, but I had been with him so long. I was scared of what do I do after I leave? I didn't know what to do. That fear of Mm -hmm. what's next, same Mm -hmm. feeling. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what to do. If we leave, then what? But now I have children and their friends and my husband and his music and all these things extra. So two and a half years with occasional comments made by me at small group, but never an actual conversation of any value with anybody, you know? And we kept hanging out with the same people, holiday meals, et cetera, et cetera. Then we finally leave probably August or September of 2022. And. Wow. I didn't realize it was that recently that you left. Yeah. It's been a year and a half ish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. What was the last thing you said before I started recapping? Cause I was going to say something about that. It was after we left. I don't know. Um, oh, the apology. That's what it was. So Yeah, so they left. jumped on the apology like blood in the water. Right. Yeah. So then after I left, I waited before I shared my testimony online. And even watching that now, oh my goodness, I watched it a few weeks ago. I was like, I, I just want to check. Like everybody is always messaging me how blessed they are by it. And I'm like, I wonder how I sound. Like how, how, do you, to how does that sound to you now? Yes, I sound scared out of my mind to mm-hmm. myself now. Mm-hmm. When I hear it, I'm like, oh my goodness, I am walking on eggshells trying yes. to yes. Don't not hurt the people or offend anybody, but I want to share my story. And it's like, why am I so scared? Like, if you're that scared of 
a person or people that you think love you. Yeah, I, I don't know. It, it was just really weird to watch myself now hear so, the testimony. I want to um trying to figure out where I can bring this up. I want to. Okay, so we've had Doug come on the program several times and talk about mm-hmm. how there's a there's a link between Calvinism and narcissism. And then there's a bunch of research on what being yoked up with a narcissist does to you, whether it's in marriage or something else. And having a narcissist in your life kind of leaves, like if you if one, somebody was ever married to one, it kind of leaves a footprint on them of uh, they, they have self-abandonment problems, toxic shame, harsh inner critic, social anxiety, emotional flashbacks. And you can kind of sense this. And then they're, mm-hmm. they're also, you know, people get triggered in their limbic system to go into fight, flight, freeze, or fawn mode. Mm-hmm. And so it's hard to tell someone that. But when, when you were coming out of that, these videos you were making, conversations you were having, I was sensing this footprint on you. Mm-hmm. Like real similar to as if you had been married to a narcissist that had left their footprint on you of reacting in this way. And it kind of takes you out of your prefrontal cortex and puts you back in the middle part of your brain. So in other words, the, the best, most developed parts of our logical brain are, are less available to us because we constantly feel so threatened by the presence of the narcissist and their tax tactics on us. And, uh, I, I think there's a huge crossover between narcissism and Calvinism and that it was showing itself. Um, mm-hmm. it was showing itself fairly evidently with that kind of sheepish apologetic behavior that you had. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I know that even just reading my Bible, I don't know if you remember once I sent you this passage from either probably Timothy, one of the Timothy letters mm-hmm. where it's talking about a divisive person and do not argue with such a one that wants to fight over words and, yeah, I'm like, I can't Timothy read two, this. Two I can't read this without feeling like, is this what I did? Is this <clears> what, <throat> what, you know, but then I told you, but honestly, what I think it is, is that there's still gaslighting happening to me, yes. even by myself yes. at home. Yeah. Residual <laughs> gaslighting. Yes. And so I'm reading this text and I can't even read it in context because I've been so gaslit for so long, being called divisive for so long hoping I'm not being divisive. I don't really want to be divisive. I really just, you know, have a genuine desire to talk to, which I, I always say that as an example, I have a genuine desire to talk. I haven't wanted to talk about Calvinism with any friends since three years ago, because it proved itself to not be go anywhere. Mm -hmm. So fruitful. So I let go of that forever, but I wanted to talk about it on YouTube forever. Then I waited till I left my church. Yeah. But you know, that residual gaslighting. Yes. I felt that I felt the mind control stuff. Even the, even if no one intentionally does it, it's still happened to me. You know, Yeah. There's certain things that happen as a result of being mixed up in an ideology that Mm -hmm. because of the nature of an ideology and an ideological in group can't not happen. Mm-hmm. So it's it's not like there's anybody over there at that church who's like intentionally trying to be a narcissist, but mm-hmm. a, a propositionally normative in group has that effect on people anyway. You you don't get to opt out of that, mm-hmm. and so it's going to have that effect. Yeah. Well, I sensed that, and thankfully, I never fell into shame because I I don't know shame just doesn't work on me. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, <laughs> I just never fell into that. And I, I always checked my motives. You know, I listened to someone call me divisive or you are this or you're that. And I would check my motives and really self-reflect. Am I being this or that? No, that is not my desire. Right. Right. And, and I could move forward confidently in myself knowing that that's not what I'm doing. You know, you have me all wrong or I can't win with you. Like you're not going to believe anything good about me, no matter what I say. So you just have to let go. Um, So like you're, you're just genuinely being open. mm -hmm. Um, You're what I would call uh, Ash negative. (laughs) And what, (laughs) and what that, well, Ash positive, they did some experiments on people for those in the audience who may not have heard of it, where people will, if, 
if you're with a group of people who all think the same way or who all give the same answer, even if you know it's not right, 70, more than 70% of people will go with the group, even though they see something differently. And here you are, you're in this Calvinist in group and you started to see something differently in scripture. And so now you are willing to start coming out. And so there's a, what you might call earnestness there. Mm-hmm. There's this earnestness of uh, one of the definitions of science is the earnest endeavor to put in order the facts of reality. And so it sounds like what you're doing is the earnest endeavor to put in order the facts of scripture, something like that. Mm-hmm. And you're coming up with, you're landing in a different place than your in group is. Mm-hmm. And you're willing to own that, embrace it, follow that, that, that should be celebrated. Um, mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Not everybody's path is the same. Not everybody's path is going to be in Calvinism and people should be allowed to grow out of it. So that's, um, it's, it's disappointing to me that, yeah, you were treated the way you were because of that. That's what every Christian mm-hmm. should be doing. Every Christian yeah. should be like earnestly seeking out what is up and mm-hmm. you There's were doing threat, that and you're the bad guy. Mm-hmm. There's a threat there though. And I, again, when you, when you're falling in line and you're like doing the thing that you're supposed to do, everything seems peachy. It's when you fall out of line that you realize, oh, <laughs> you know, how many times has stuff like this happened behind the scenes since I've been here and I had no idea, you know? Um, so when you said threat, can you yes. double click on that? What is being yes. threatened? People coming out of Calvinism too, (laughs) or people (laughs) revisiting Calvinism or checking, you know, what I have to say, giving me, lending me their ear, lending me my, uh, will their willingness to hear me reason, share my reasoning and my side. Um, and that I guess is a threat, you know? So I think that's, I think that's absolutely the perfect word because like psychologically what's going on is people have identified them. They've they've become emotionally attached to the idea of Calvinism to where they see it as kind of part of themselves. And Mm -hmm. the more people who hold that Calvinism, like if you're in a church that has a hundred people, like your, your identity is now a hundred people big, you see? And when people start to come to the cognitive level of awareness to where they doubt the central meme of the Calvinist meme complex and decide to leave, that person feels what it feels like in their body is that their identity is being attacked because now their identity Calvinism was once a hundred people strong in this little church. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know how many people we're talking about. Yeah. But just, I'm just throwing a number out there. And now mm-hmm. it's, you know, 96 people strong. People feel like their identity being eaten away because they have identified with something that is external to them. And there's mm-hmm. like uh, identity confusion about who they are. And as, and as Doug also says, it, it takes away your identity. So Calvinism is your only identity. So when you start to decrease the volume of territory that Calvinism occupies, mm-hmm. they feel a decrease in the volume of territory that their identity occupies. So I think mm-hmm. like psychologically in their body, they really do feel it as a threat mm-hmm. similar to how their body would feel if you were hiking through the woods and, in, and encountered a poisonous snake by surprise, the same mm-hmm. kind of thing is happening in the body. So yeah, I think they do feel threatened. It's like that um, you have a, a diagram where the path to growth, like you're, you're inter- you're, something's challenged and there's the growth path and then there's the floundering reaction or the denial mm-hmm. or all those different deni- uh, reactions. I've seen all of those. And I mean, the buckling down and just like digging your heels to harder into yep. it. I saw that. I saw the fear. Um, I mean, I even did those. Like I did them in years past when I read the Matthew. I guess I just, I don't remember what they were specifically on your diagram, but I know I did one of those. And then it wasn't until I was challenged again that I feel I went the growth path. I didn't ignore the clear contradictions <laughs> and the, right. I need to address this. I can't just pretend this doesn't exist, you know? Um, but I did want to say one thing. I meant to say this way in the beginning. Obviously, these are all very general statements. 
every single individual of my old church, some of them don't even know me. Like it, it's not like my whole church is treating me this way or that way. Some people probably don't even notice I'm gone yet. You know, if anything, they notice the music's changed because Hector is not the drummer anymore. But you oh. know, <laughs> there's some people that don't even know that we're gone. And then there's some people that probably are like, they knew me a little, but they weren't in my life. I'm talking about like the people that were in my life for the last 17 years, you know, not just people that have come and gone because I'm making very general statements, but it doesn't apply to every individual. And because I'm not an irrational person, I'm not trying to say this entire church treated me this way. Some people treated me bad ways and some people would still be nice to me if they saw me in public, but they're just not going to have me over for dinner anymore. You know, right, right. like it's everybody's a different category, but it's still not okay. What's happened, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to say that. Um, I was just telling, um, <laughs> I have a friend that I was hanging out with yesterday, actually a photographer. Um, and I was telling her the way people treat, like the way Christians treat each other online is, mm -hmm is pretty terrible. And I, and I just sent her an excerpt today. I also sent it to Paula of somebody else's acting back up, but like, uh, me and Paula are about to go to volleyball tonight and we have a lot of friends there. And if we change our beliefs or we could become Buddhist tomorrow and, uh, change all of our practices, whatever, and we would not lose any friends there. Mm -hmm. Whereas it, if like in, in these mammon churches as i call them they're not really they don't really have a relationship with you they have a relationship with calvinism as long as you are territory that it occupies mm -hmm. as long as you are an avatar of calvinism they will relate to it through you because that's where their identity is and as long and when you get plucked out and you no longer are part of the territory uh occupied by the calvinist identity like what are you even, <laughs> you right. know, you're not part of yeah. the Borg anymore. Yeah. So you can be assimilated it's, or die. And they, when it's Calvinists, wild. They can't. People actually said those words. It's like, well, before we had the same doctrine and we went to the same church, but now that we don't, you know, and I'm like, are you nuts? Like we hang out every week. Like <laughs> what does that have to do with, hanging out every week as a homeschool yeah. family, you know, yeah. it's in bizarre. And, and I had one conversation, one conversation with someone about, they brought it up. They brought it up about penal substitutionary atonement. And I just shared some thoughts and I was like, I don't know, like for sure what I think, but these are just some thoughts I've had. And they said, uh, I don't know what I could do. What I, I don't know what I, what I can, if I could have someone that believes like that in my life. And I was like, <laughs> what? We're just talking. How can you be that extreme? You know? So it's out there. I mean, it's real. Those people just actually put it into words, but most people wouldn't admit stuff like that, yeah. that they won't be your friend unless you think like them, you know? So we, you know, we were talking earlier. I think this, this is worth mentioning before I, um, before it slips out of my mind, when it comes to ideology, I was looking at this book, The Coddling of the American Mind, and the chapter five is called Witch Hunts. And mm -hmm. we, we throw this term witch hunts around as, a, as an analogy and a figure of speech that we constantly use. But the actual real witch hunts were conducted by Calvinists under Cotton Mather in Salem, yes. Massachusetts. It, it was a Calvinist thing to hunt people down, try them and kill them. And I know it's... we did, we're doing early American history this year and my boys yes. were reading and they were like, mom, come here. The Calvinists are the ones that killed the witches in yeah. the Salem witch trials. I was like, why? Yeah. And they showed me, I'm like, okay, and mommy so the... would have been killed and burned at the stake. Yeah. You would have. <laughs> so the only difference between those Calvinists and these Calvinists today is that today they're no longer allowed to kill you. They can right. no longer burn you at the stake or hang you or have you drown legally. Right. Mm -hmm. But we know from history that they would if they could. Yes. Because that's and, what the ideology does to people. Right. I've, I've had my 
my equivalent to being burned at the stake. This was a four page document. Oh my. One, two, three. That looks like small font too. Four. That's against my religion. And Someone a line. And a line. That's... Someone, someone wrote this about me. About me. About and you. It's, yeah, it's written in third person. It's not like to me. It's not a letter. And supposedly it was written in love. Um, it was it horrifying. Too? I don't know. But there's clickable links on it. And <laughs> it's written in third person. And it's Is this like a blog post? Like just put it publicly? Or no, did, was it this turned is, into the elders? I don't know. I asked them more than once, who did you share this with? And they said no one. So I've never read it publicly because I didn't want to. Do you know seem... who wrote it? Oh, yeah. A, a friend that we've traveled out of the country together. Like, this is a person that was in my life for 15 years. Um, we had our children grew up together. I mean, we, we, we have been friends for 15 years. And I was like, why would you take a little, you know, the, as long time, as long as it took you to write this, why wouldn't you just hang out and chat right. with us? Yeah. You know, talk yeah. to me, man. You're my friend, right? And I mean, the lies in here are horrific, twisty, and just so hard to believe it was written in love. But this is my version of, you know, this is the slander campaign against there's, me. There's no, there's no hate like Christian love. Man, Christian love. And you, the reason why that's what my this, atheist friend says man, when I explain sad. how, how Christians treat me on the channel and like, if <laughs> I, I don't ever get any hate from agnostics or atheists or anything else or Buddhists or Hindus. I don't get hate from these people. I get hate from Christians. And yeah. uh, when I, when I share some of these comments, I got a buddy who's an atheist. We play guitar together. And uh, he's like, yeah, there's no hate like Christian love. <laughs> it's absolutely it's so right. bad. So, I mean, are would, there would, any, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. Are there any like excerpts out of that that are, you want to share? Um, I'll share the first sentence and then the, the part that makes me the most angry. Um, so the first sentence, okay, let me tell you the truth first. And then you hear the way he spins it. The truth is I started my YouTube channel. 11 years ago, 12 years ago. And I was super shy about it. I didn't tell any friends. I was so shy. And every now and then somebody would come up to me and be like, I found you on YouTube. I'm like, no, don't tell anybody, you know, <laughs> and little by little more and more people started finding it. Yeah. So I told Hector, I was like, what do I do? I need to like delete my channel. I don't want people to know about my channel. Stop telling people I have a channel. And he said, babe, you either delete your channel or get used to the idea that people are going to find it. You're online. You can't hide the, right. the fact yeah. that you have a channel. And I was like, okay, I need to just get comfortable with it. I want to have my channel. I felt such fulfillment sharing yep. and encouraging women. So I finally got over that. And I mean, it's been like five, six, seven years now since I got over that. Well, the first, that's the truth. Okay. This is what he says. Alana. No, it's, it's funny. It's, the genesis so the title the genesis that was very <laughs> oh, dramatic oh my goodness you ought to be like a movie announcer <laughs> alana <laughs> was growing an online following for years with youtube messages she didn't want members of the church to see oh my goodness what what impression does that give anybody like that i'm kind of clandestine operative yes horrifying and then the thing that's the most frustrating, because it's a blatant lie, everything else is twisty like that. But the, the worst is I Raymond. saw there was a video of hers that I watched where several pastors were mentioned by name who believe scripture teaches limited atonement. She called these pastors wolves. We will be held accountable for every word that comes out of our mouths. Now for the truth. I posted a Faith on Fire video on Facebook. Do you yeah. know that channel, Brian? And it was called something like the Diminished Doctrines of Grace, something like that. Mm -hmm. And in that video, and th this was a mistake, I 
overlooked that part of the video. I wasn't focused on that part of the video. I mm -hmm. posted it, not paying attention. So he calls these men wolves. I've never called anybody a wolf or a false teacher or anything mean, anything. And he says he watched a video of mine where I called them that. That's not true. So I posted that video on Facebook. It was a stupid decision. I took it down and I made a public apology the next day. Like, I'm so sorry. I do not agree with that man. I didn't even notice that he said that. Right, I right. overlooked it, whatever. Of course, they're not going to believe me. No rule omega with these guys. Mm -hmm. None. The, yeah. Oh, which reminds me of this quote. This man, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Do you know? Yes. Do you know him? Poet. <laughs> yeah. He did this quote, two quotes, actually, that have stuck out to me. Um, People can call you a mystic if you start quoting Ralph Waldo Emerson. I like a lot of his poems. <laughs> I've read many of them to my children throughout the years of homeschooling. You get some but more they're profound. The they're profound. Yeah. Um, what, there's one friendship quote that he says, um, old, you should be able to say stupid things with old friends, yeah. right? What does that imply? Grace, man. Sorry, I messed up. You know, <laughs> like, don't you love me? Why would you hold that to against me for so long? You know, so it's just a shame. And then he has another one that says, uh, I do not wish to treat friendships daintily, but with the roughest courage when they're real, they're not glass threads or frost work, but the solidest thing we know. Oh, real wow. Friendship. That's yes. great. It's fantastic. That's great. You're going to be walking on eggshells around people that you, that are, you know, they're not your real friend. Yeah, I would, I would imagine that would extend over to uh, marriage partners as well, because totally, you know, I'm, I'm happily married now. I was not in my previous life. <laughs> and so there was it was that mm -hmm. kind of thing where there's a fragility there. You, the, you, the truth is going to have everything come crumbling down. But a, a, a true friend you'd be able to be true with. Mm hmm. Um, I felt like I was gonna, yeah, let me, um, there's a super chat here and solitary Emmy says, I wonder if you guys believe Calvinists are saved. And so I can't speak for Alana, but I do not ever make any assessments on whether or not anybody is saved. I do make analysis judgments on whether or not the data matches. If, if Calvinistic data does not match, you know, first Corinthians 15, one through four. Or Ephesians 1 13 or Romans 5 2 or 1 Corinthians 1 21 or Hebrews 2 9 or 1 John or John 1 12 through 13 or 1 John 2 2. You know, I will call it out. That's a, that's a data mismatch. And then I've, I've been very vocal before that there is no gospel in Calvinism. So I do not make an assessment on whether or not Calvinists are saved. I just make an assessment that the data does not match scripture or, or what constituted Christian Christianity you know, hundreds of years before any version of Calvinism ever showed up with Augustine or afterward. Yeah. I have a lot of grace there. I don't go around, you know, uh, assuming who is and who isn't saved. I think, right. Uh, you know, are you following Jesus? You know, do you believe Jesus is who he says he was? And I, I was a Calvinist and I know I was a Christian. I just, yeah. I got, um sidetracked and put my i didn't realize that i put my not my hope um i was following a man-made doctrine and it was yeah. in mm -hmm. error it wasn't it wasn't at the cost of walking away from the lord it was just a distraction uh but I was still following the Lord, you know, right, I, I don't know. Right. I think it's harsh to go down that road. It can be. Um, yeah. It's, so when you start calling things out, it's like, I disagree with something. It's like pe everyone wants to go there. I'm like, well, mm -hmm. we're, we're not talking about the people who are ensnared yeah. by it. You know, exactly. Dr. Ruckman was talking to some Jehovah's witnesses one time and uh, the Jehovah's witness lady, he asked her, he, he's, she's like, do you think I'm saved or going to hell? And he's like, didn't you say you were a Baptist when you were a little girl? Yeah. Didn't you receive Christ when you were a Baptist? Yeah. Well, I'm not worried about you, <laughs> you know, and I've yeah. never met a Calvinist 
uh, who was actually a Calvinist when they got saved. You yeah. know, and people can be confused with all kinds of things once they're mm -hmm. saved. I think Mike W., who I talked to quite a bit um, on your one of your live streams last week, yeah, said he was presented the Calvinist. Maybe I'm wrong, Mike W. I'm sorry if if that's wrong. I feel like in our conversation he said that he was presented the Calvinist gospel when he became a Christian, that, and I that, was. That would be really interesting to double click on. Like, mm -hmm. what exactly did they say? You know, have you watched the Warren McGrew videos, the mm -hmm. idol killer videos, Honest Calvinists? Yes. You know? Oh, my word. <laughs> Look, Fantastic. Mike, w., it, it, it's <laughs> most likely that Christ did not die for you. But in the mm -hmm. slim chance that he did, I'm going to say these magic words about the gospel. And if you're elect and you're one of the sheep, and if you're ready, according to Greg Kokel, uh, mm -hmm. then your ears will perk up and you'll be regenerated because that's the ordained means. So here we go. Let me read the magic words. <laughs> Oh my word, it's so bad. <laughs> I mean, that, that's no. what the, that's mm -hmm. what the Calvinist gospel presentation would be. Mm -hmm. And then Man. the thing that gets me too is like the, these magic word things in Greg Kokel's book. He's like, you know, all the sheep here. And then later on in the book, he says, except for if they're not ready. Well, mm -hmm. hold on, do the sheep hear or don't they? Mm -hmm. Well, I say that in one of my one of my videos like what takes the irresistible grace so long to kick in for some people it's like <laughs> is, what happened <laughs> is the gospel the ordained means or not yes and then there's statistics that a person has to hear the gospel 12 times before they actually believe or something like that i'm like yeah, why would there be a statistic if yeah. it's an irresistible grace thing for only yeah. the elect it just doesn't add up like like several other funny statistics like the one John Piper has shared that a certain kind of personality type is drawn to Calvinism. Why? If it's the truth, you know, yeah. and why would male, male, white males be the predominant Calvinist? Yeah, it's, a certain personality type is drawn yes. to Calvinism. They're called narcissists. It's yeah, man. I'm not a narcissist. <laughs> that statement's narcissistic. I'm just kidding. Uh, hey, I was a Calvinist too. Uh, yeah, but. 19 years for me and how like five months for you or something no like a year <laughs> oh, it was uh and it's hard to it, it was a better part of two years okay well, good for you man you woke up <laughs> i do i do um oh my goodness anyway i'm gonna ignore comments <laughs> yeah so i'm trying Alana. to ignore all the comments except for super chats that is so funny. See, this is my response to comments that are offensive to most people. I laugh at them because I'm just like, you're so mistaken. <laughs> anyway, so let's see. I wanted to share how once, oh yeah, I did want to say, you know how, how sometimes you're in an argument I think of a guy more than a, a woman, like a man just trying to like, make up with his wife and or his girlfriend and she's just being so difficult and he just doesn't know what to say so he just is like i'm just sorry like can we just like make everything okay why do you have to stay upset like i don't even know what i'm saying sorry about because you won't talk to me i can't read your mind i don't know what you need and what you want but i'm just sorry you know that's that that's kind of how my apologies were i'm having flashbacks <laughs> I've, been, I've been that person. <laughs> I was that person for years. Man, <laughs> poor guys. I'm my channel is all about marriage, but I usually side with the men. Is that terrible? I'm like, women are so difficult, but for real. <laughs> no, I for like real. like with they kind of are like we are. We are. Paula is so different from most women that like I need her to stay alive because I don't think I can go back. <laughs> to mm -hmm. to whatever else is out there if this doesn't work out <laughs> man she's yeah she's amazing that's great what a blessing absolutely and i'm blessed that hector can handle somebody like me because i feel like <laughs> i feel like a lot of the people i've been around you know probably frown very much upon the fact that i came out of calvinism first the fact that I brought it to Hector, 
they probably view it as he was, you know, like the passage where it says Adam was deceived or Eve was deceived yeah, first, right, all that right. stuff. Oh, first I could just see all that happening, you know, so the, all those conversations. The, there's a, uh, there's a, you, not a YouTube, there's a video, you know, Steve Harvey, the host of Family Feud, he, mm -hmm. he has this talk show, he's a talk show and he was interviewing this woman who's having a hard time finding a date. And she was like, she had a lot going on in her career and, and wanted a guy who had this, 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 and this. And, and anyway, uh, after a few minutes of her talking, he's like, lady, I know why you can't find a date. Cause you a lot. <laughs> 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 oh. Kind of like, I got it. I'd be lying if I said that I didn't think of, uh, you and Paula when I heard that. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's hilarious. That's uh, so I don't mean like a lot in a bad way. I just sure. think that like you're an intense driven person. Like mm -hmm. you, you are not going to go along with something that you aren't convinced is the right mm -hmm. thing or the best thing. Mm -hmm. We got a totally. um, super chat here. If you don't mind, if we take a look at this for a second, Eon tactics. Thanks for the super chat. Don't you think it matters which Jesus you believe in the Jesus who tasted death for every man versus a perverted version that Calvinism preaches. I do think it matters. I absolutely do. So yes, to answer that question, uh, second, second Corinthians 11, three and four. Absolutely. Galatians one, six through nine. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All day long. Definitely applies. Somebody told me the other day, Calvinism is biblical. And I quote, <laughs> and I quoted, Second Corinthians 11, 3 and 4 and Galatians 1, 6 through 9. I said, yes, I agree. It's biblical. It's mentioned right here. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know, man. Do you want me to say something too or just move on? Like Whatever you want. you want. I just, when I see stuff, I know what he's getting at. Like, since they believe in the wrong Jesus, then they're not really saved because you have to believe in the right Jesus to truly be saved. I understand that logic. I just think, that it's putting it, it we all got something wrong right well and paul is saying ahead. this to believe oh no not you not you i'm sorry not paul like that comment the yeah question. yeah yeah i'm just i mean for yeah. the sake of this guy my mm -hmm. like yeah I, I feel the pressure like don't, yeah isn't following the right jesus important yes but it's it seems like the corinthians were in christ but had mm -hmm. been dissuaded to some kind of you know, mm -hmm. false thing. Yes. And, and Galatians too. Yeah. And Galatians are beautiful. The, I, I can't help but read Galatians and always think of Calvinism, even though it's about circumcision, just the bewitching and the, another gospel and adding to the gospel. All of that is. Yeah. So the, the reason that it's similar like that is because it's both dealing with first half of life wisdom. So the the Old Testament law is supposed to be first half of life. What was that? Sorry, my dogs. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Here, guys, get them out. I'm so sorry. Okay. I I turned your camera off for a second because I wasn't I wasn't sure what was about to happen. So <laughs> so even in Galatians, it even tells you like the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. And this is the same mm -hmm. thing as like first half of life wisdom it needs to have rules, order, structure, discipline, boundaries, that kind of thing. And then when you're ready to appropriate wisdom for yourself, it's time to be kicked out of the nest. You got to fly. You know, there's a, uh, you're not, you're on a, you're on a, in an ATV out in the woods. You're not on a rail car. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's a different kind of thing. And so Calvinism, fundamentalist Christianity, the Old Testament Judaism, it's all it's all rules, structure, discipline. It's all first half of life wisdom stuff that people need the rules, order, structure, and discipline in a certain port, part of their life, but then they need to start cultivating wisdom at some point where there, there are no, you should be able to, yeah, drive around in an ATV mm -hmm. without guardrails holding you down. And I do, I think I needed it. I mean, I, I can, I, it's really hard when you've been hurt <laughs> to, it, you want to just be like, everything's terrible, but that's not true. You know, the truth is 
I had a great 17 years at my church. I loved the people. I loved the things I learned there. I grew in many ways there. I have beautiful memories. My children had beautiful memories. There's a lot of good. There is. And I think the, that's the, the easy road would be to just say everything. Everybody was actually fake. Nobody ever throw it all me. away. Yep. Yeah. Throw it all away. And that's not true. And I honestly think in the long run, that's not healthy for my heart. I think the healthiest thing is to admit the truth and take the good and, and also not be naive to, or cover up the wrong. Like there's been a lot of wrong. So and... I, I think that's a mature response. You know, children, ideologues and people with personality disorders, they do something called splitting where everything's either all good or all bad. And once something is knocked off the pedestal, it becomes all bad right away. Mm -hmm. But the mature person, they can be divorced, for example, be like, yeah, that relationship didn't work out, but I really appreciated this, this, and this about the person, and I wish them well and hope they do well, and there were good parts to that life. That, you know, that's the mature response. It's not all bad. And the same thing mm -hmm. with a bad church experience. It may have not ended well, but um, you lived your life there. You mm -hmm. shared your life with those people, and you had good times, and you smiled and laughed and cried mm -hmm. together, I'm sure. Yeah. And that's, that's not all bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just easy as a self-protect to want to do that and mm -hmm. to like just let it all, this bad experience taint everything. I do think it made the healing process longer to, re to remain soft-hearted. But way in the beginning of this whole journey, I shared this in a video recently, I was reading 1 Timothy and Paul said something to the effect of, do everything in love with a with a pure heart and a clear conscience something mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. and i remember thinking whatever happens this is how i'm gonna walk through this this is how what i'm gonna do because i don't want to have i want to have a clear conscience i want to love no matter what comes my way and i want to have pure motives um and i really think the lord helped me do that I, I don't feel bitter, like you mentioned. I don't feel resentful. I can be re realistic and say, man, this person did some messed up stuff, but I don't hate them. I just can see like that was messed up, you know? And it's uh, it doesn't affect much at this point, especially. I don't even feel, I don't know what happened. The turning point for me uh, was early earlier this year, I just feel like I've been on this rapid healing, almost like within a couple of months, it's just like over, it's finally over, it feels like, because forever it was up and down, up and down, but now it yeah. feels over, you know, which is probably why I could talk about it without crying the whole time to you. <laughs> Cause, oh so, man. you know, I had a, I had a church falling out scenario in 20, 2002 in June of 2002 so it's 22 years ago and it still weighs heavily on me sometimes mm -hmm. um so it's 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 not like um when people talk about getting over things it's, it's not like it's like when a person dies it's it's not like you get over it it's that you learn to have that now as part of your life mm -hmm. I want to double click on this passage just for a second that and out of first Timothy, I just want to emphasize that when Timothy says this statement, now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. So this is the same guy that wrote faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. So this charity is love. It's agape here. And when he says the, he's right at the beginning, it's first Timothy one, five. And so the the desired, the, how we would say that in the military is the desired end state is charity. In other words, all the things I'm going to tell you for the next six chapters, the pinnacle thing here is charity, agape, love. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like we have a difficult time getting that message as Christians sometimes. Mm -hmm. 
John 13, 35, by this shall all men know you are my disciples, that you have love one for another. And there's a, there's a lot of Christian hate floating around. <laughs> it is. There's so much, so much that calls us to bear with one another, to in, believe all things, hope all things, to be patient with one, with one another, gentle with one another, all these things. And it seems to like be all the forgotten verses and instead a divisive fractal brother cut him off if he offends you three times cut him out like let's use those verses instead it's like what why why can't you see the call to love your brother you know love your brother love your sister be peace keepers peacemakers um, it's, so it's the factional ones it's the factional ones that are warned against in scripture like, oh, mm -hmm. we're Calvinist here. That is factional. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of John Calvin. I'm of Augustine. I'm of Arminius. That kind of thing. So mm -hmm. since since leaving that Calvinist church, you are you get along just fine with Leighton Flowers, and you're not a provisionist. You mm -hmm. get along just fine with me, and there's no telling how much we don't see eye to eye. No clue. But like, mm -hmm. so you know, and that's it. Doesn't matter. You see, it just yeah. doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It's because we're relating as people. And <laughs> oh yeah. I've got friends from so many churches here in town so, and so what I'm trying to say I think is that the move that you made like you went from this ideological in group into this place where you are holding steady cuz we had a conversation about some of the things you disagree with with some of the other folks that are pretty common pretty common doctrines people talk about so you are holding steady with the perspective that you hold and you're able to receive perspective from others. So you're like, you're doing this little dance of the Ephesians 4.16 edification model where you can hear other perspectives and it doesn't uh, ruin your day or call, make you feel threatened. And you can mm -hmm. share perspectives openly and freely and earnestly without feeling like you have to virtue signal or hold back for like afraid what I'll think of it. And mm -hmm. so you've made this move in an upward direction, which is actually perfectly the exact kind of growth that a Christian should be making as per Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, growing up into him in all things. Like that's the pattern of what you've done is exactly that. And because you grow, you get ostracized. Like you're not coming over for dinner anymore. <laughs> it's the mm -hmm. most bizarre thing. It is bizarre. It's and a shame is like, what it is. What man. you've done is exactly what pe everyone should be getting prompted by their preachers to also do. Mm -hmm. You see? And then yeah. and then you finally have huh, this church that you were at finally has one good thing happen, which is what happened to you, and then that's the bad thing. That's crazy. Yeah. I think that's a crazy. problem with churches in general. And then, and then the problem then next, and I'm, I'm just running my mouth. It's supposed to be your story, no, <laughs> but I the problem next sure. is that, like you said, when you outgrow mammon church, you're like, where do I go? I don't know where I'm supposed to go. What is there for me? And oftentimes there, it's not obvious what there is for you. And so people think you've left church or you're backsliding and anything like mm -hmm. that. And really all it is, is you've, you've graduated from the third grade and there's no fourth grade around. That's that's all that's happened. You see what I'm saying? And yes. I'm not I'm not saying third grade. I mean it could be you you graduated from mm -hmm. a bachelor's program and there's no master's program or it doesn't matter mm -hmm. what level. Just the point is sure. like whatever your next step is, that church did not have available. N nothing in your proximal zone of development was a was available for you. Yeah. I think ideally um you know, having multiple views under one place sharpens each other, you know, that, yeah. that's healthy. It's healthy. And this is a question I would ask over and over and it was never answered. It was always dodged. Isn't it healthy to talk about different views? <laughs> yeah. Or do Isn't you want an echo chamber? Yeah. And, and it was always like silence, no answer. I'm like, oh my goodness, you don't think it is. You want everyone to think the same. And I do think you know, some things just happen, like people just somehow 
a culture develops, even if the leaders don't spell it out somehow, I don't know how that happens, but I do think that the fact that we didn't agree with the elders on tulip or Calvinism, whatever, all of that was like, we were doing something wrong and it's just not, it's like, stop and think about that for a minute. You're wrong because you don't agree or think the same way or view the same way mm-hmm. with the leadership. Mm-hmm. Why? Why is that wrong? It's not yeah. morally wrong. It, what, what kind of wrong? Yeah. In is what it? way is it wrong? Yes. And these are the questions I had to work through. Oh, not that one so much, but like later I would guilt trip my, I would, I would not guilt trip myself. I would just ask over and over, should I have just not shared my story? You know, and in a way, it's kind of like the Jordan Peterson quote that I put on my channel the other day. Every decision, you 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 got to choose which poison you're going to drink. Like this decision yep. is going to cost you this, yep. or this one's going to cost you this. They're both going to cost you something. Which poison? I did not expect this. <laughs> I <laughs> expected possible botheredness and maybe a friend or two or three or four calling and being like, oh my goodness. You shared your story online. Can I have some questions for you? You know, I expected that. Yeah. But I did not expect this. So I chose my poison, but I didn't know this was going to be it, you know. Um, and you've talked about Nine Marks before on your channel. This was a Nine Marks church that we went to. So we not only didn't agree with the doctrine anymore, we withdrew our membership so that means we broke covenant which means we committed a corporate sin and the fact that we didn't align ourselves under another real church under oversight of elders puts us in the hands of satan so that's what some people not all Mm -hmm. some people told us and so i've seen in the past a couple of people be told this same kind of Thing and they've come crawling back with letters of apology and rejoined. And I, I don't know if they went against their better judgment and just gave in to the pressure or if they truly feel like they sinned and they wanted to apologize. I don't know. Was but it over the same issue? I was, don't Was it over so. departure from Calvinism? I don't think so. No. I think we're the first, at least that I've ever heard of that has left because of that. Yeah. Um, so it's just interesting. Yeah. Um, Nine Marks is real big on the church discipline component. Mm-hmm. And um, there's, there's one degree to where, yes, you do have to have that, but then there's, there's another degree to where it seems like, the church discipline aspect is a convenient cover story for them to achieve ideological purity in a church. Yeah. It's really, man, I definitely don't think of it the way I used to. I mean, I, I definitely thought it sounded so wonderful um, when it was first introduced to us. But again, I was, I was only hearing that side. You know, when you yeah. hear the arguments of why this is actually not healthy, um, I I see the damage that it's capable of doing now. I mean, we've we've been told it feels like we're divorced. It's like I still live in the same town. I'm still a Christian. <laughs> like we're here. Our kids are friends. Like we're not divorced. Let's hang out. You know, yeah. I just won't see you Sunday morning. Why are are you doing this? You know, um, but it's just very odd and it it's it is a group think element you know uh and i guess it would take a lot for someone to be strong enough or brave enough to stay my friend maybe i don't know um and they just don't have it in them to to take the heat if there's any heat i i really don't know i because again there's no communication so i i'm left guessing for a lot of things um yeah, that's so that's one of the most that's one of the most difficult things I think is that you're kind of in the dark. There's all kinds of you know there's a, bu- a bunch of things floating around about you with all those people that used to be your friends and you're just left guessing. So there's there's an injustice component 
there's a behind your back slander component and then you just don't know what's happening over there Mm -hmm. and so it's kind of uh and the lack of like complete final closure because it's Mm -hmm. not like they're physically dead it's not like you're physically it's not like you're gone so you you could you could run into each other in the grocery store you could call each other up Mm -hmm. on the phone and go hang out and you know so Mm -hmm. there's like the those components of that Mm -hmm. not knowing and then not complete closure Mm -hmm. it i can only imagine it's kind of hard to suss out where you should be emotionally and spiritually with regard to all this Mm -hmm. as you're going through it how's that um and and i'm and i'm honestly I'm, i'm shocked in a good way that you're able to suss that out and still remember the good even though there's a lot of pain associated with what happened to you in the aftermath Mm -hmm. how is that how does that how do you balance all that what's going on with you (laughs) you and hector what's going on Mm -hmm. with that i think i'm out of the hardest season for sure i'm not in the pit anymore last spring i was devastated summer and then it got better and better, but it would come in, in you know, un, unanticipated waves. Right, um, right. But I'm so much better now. And, and you know, I'm not, I live in the South, but I'm not a Southerner. So to me, <laughs> if I don't want you in my life. Bless your heart. And I, right. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Bless my heart. What, <laughs> do you care about my heart? Um, <laughs> if, if I don't want it's you elect. in my life. You have an elect heart. <laughs> Oh Maybe one goodness. of your heart chambers is elect and the other one isn't. <laughs> That's is so bad. But <laughs> I would never, like if, if you wanted to be my friend and you text me and you called me and I just cut you out of my life all of a sudden, I no longer respond to any of your messages. I don't respond to any of your phone calls. Yeah. I don't say anything to you. And then I see you in the store. I'm going to be consistent and be like, I don't want you in my life. But yeah. that's not what goes down over here. What goes down over here is you're cut out of my life. And then you see each other and it's like, hi. And I'm like, why are you talking to me? Why are you talking to me? You said you don't want me. Yeah, in you want life. some consistency. Yes. So it seems like the you, performative contradictions are all in all in throughout all of Calvinism. It's insane. And then calling Hector for business. What? Why are you calling Hector for business? You don't talk to us. You don't want us in your life. You cut my mother off. Like, you, if you don't want us in your life, don't call for a, a way to make money off of us. Like, seriously. Yeah. yeah. It is so dirty. It's so dirty. And that's just some people, obviously. It's not everybody. But I just can't get over. I'm a very real person. So don't be fake and tell me you want me out of your life. But then if you run into me because you're freaking out right now, and you don't have the guts to just hold to what you said. You have to come and smile and say hello. You don't want to say hello to me. Just be real. Yeah, yeah. You know, They're, it's like a little virtue signal kind of thing. Oh, we're still nice. It's no, terrible. Not. And then there are some people that probably have no idea what's going on because they were not close to us that we've run into, and they clearly treat us differently. And mm. it's it's a shame because I'm like, what do you think you know? You want to talk to us? Like, why are you? What, what do you like mean that? differently? Like, they're than treating they you. To, than they so used they're to. treating you differently based on what they've heard from other people. Probably in a, in a negative mm-hmm. way. It seems that way. Yeah. So it's not, so it's not like a warm or friendlier thing. It's a mm-hmm. no. It's a cold, distant. I don't know what to do. And and we had one family like the whole time we were talking to them. I was like, Are you all right? <laughs> Like they're just nodding their head, solemn and sad. I'm like, you want to ask us what's up? Like, it seems like you know what's up, but we're confused, you know? It's just a sad, it's sad. Communication is so valuable if you just have the guts to have it, you know? So I want to, I want to, an analogy just popped in my head. It seems like may have been what happened to you. And are you familiar with Star Wars movies? No, my children are. I might know. Okay, so when the Empire Strikes Back, Luke goes to Dagobah looking for Yoda. Okay. And Yoda's supposed to be the big wise master. Well, like the, the old wise master. He's not very mm-hmm. big. But Luke doesn't know what he looks like. And so this 
little annoying green creature shows up and is eating all his food and making a mess is just annoying, annoying, annoying. And, and Luke can't stand it. And really that, that little creature is Yoda. And then Luke realizes, Oh, that's Yoda. That's the dude I came here looking for. And he's acting like this little annoying green animal. And so, uh, and, and, you know, Yoda was testing him out, but then he realized that this thing that he did not respect as a person or as a true entity mm-hmm. was what he was looking for. And so I, I feel like the opposite happened with you. I feel like you are relating to these people as if they are real people, real entities. They can really think they are more or less like you. They assess data. They're conscientious and earnest and that sort of thing. And then one day you have this wake up call, like after this transition shifts, you move to a different place ideologically, really. And then you, they no longer relate to you. It's like you, it's like you wake up to the fact instead of Luke waking up to the fact that Yoda was more than he seemed like he was, you realize you're waking up to the fact that these people are less than what you thought they were. Like they're, Mm -hmm. they're Mm -hmm. not really people They're and to some degree, they're just avatars of Calvinism who will only relate to you as as long as you're a Calvinist. Now, that it's, it sounds easy to say that, but I can only imagine the, the timeline of the discovery and then the heartbreak mm-hmm. of realizing that this has cost you relationships that you probably didn't anticipate. And, mm-hmm. and they, these people you thought you knew essentially more or less basically became dead to you. Yeah. Oh, heartbreak is for sure. I mean, it was a, a long, sad time. But I think the biggest letdown was the friendship aspect. Like, not not the kind of friend I thought they were, you know? That is where the shock was. It's like, this is... This is what you do if the going gets tough with your friend, you know? Right. Um, it's just it's very surprising. I know I wouldn't handle any friend like that. I would be on the phone at your front door. Let's talk. What's going on? Right, right. The Omega, what is it called that you? Rule, rule Omega. Yeah. Rule Omega. I do that. Like you're yeah. allowed to say something stupid and I'm not going to hold you to it. All right, you right. said come on allow you to grace. reframe yeah yes reframe collect yourself you had a moment you just lost it for a second like that's all friend stuff you know you gotta care about people enough to where um if you're old friends and you have so much history you gotta care enough about people to pursue them understand them hear them out and not hold them to every little mistake they make you know it's just wrong and I always say this, I think the Lord is displeased, you know, on how everything's been handled. And I promise, I mean, again, guessing game, I try to think, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? But I really, I really don't know. <laughs> I honestly don't know what I did wrong, you know, but. There's a, um, where can I find this? Oh, right while, while you look for that, something you said earlier reminded me, I just posted this on my community or, or my YouTube. It says something like I was, there was a time where I, I cared so much about sharing my side of the story. Right. And I don't feel that way anymore. I truly don't. Um, now I don't care. Whatever, whatever anybody believes, fine. Before... It was this desperation, this feeling of, I want to talk, tell them my side. I want to correct the, the inaccuracies and the miscommunications or whatever. Now yeah. I don't care. And the reason I'm even wanting to share anything online has nothing to do with me. The amount of people that I've mm-hmm. watched mm-hmm. online share their story. Oh my goodness. Testimonies are so healing for, for people that are, can relate. It is a blessing to share your story, to share, to just be able to tell somebody, hey, if you're going through something similar, don't worry, you're going to be fine. Like, you're going to make it out of this. And here's my story. I'm out of it. And you're in it. But there's a there's an end, you know. 
And I have a few people that I know that are just starting to walk through some difficult times. And I hope that this can minister to them, you know, just like other people's testimonies have ministered to me. Yeah, so I think that's very, very strong. And one of the, yeah, definitely the strength of your story is not, yeah. It's, what I think I just heard you say is it's, you don't feel like you need to straighten anything out, but mm -hmm. you have like, uh, what is it? Romans 15, four, these things were written for our learning. And so you went through something, other people are going through something and it can serve as, uh, a, not only a testimony, but an encouragement that there is a, and an example and an example. Mm -hmm. So the, the hardest thing to do is encounter something like that and come through without resentment. And so like, uh, if I could just, if you're, if you're watching this, listening to this, if you, if I could call your attention to the fact that Alana has come through this without resentment, um, and, and been very, you've been very cognizant and aware of tendencies to want to feel bitter or dismissive or resentful. And you're mm -hmm. choosing to, look at things through the eyes of love, even if it costs a lot of sadness. Anyway, you're not letting that sadness mm -hmm. turn to anger, that kind of thing. That's, that's tough to do, but it is the absolute right thing to do in order for a disorder cycle to prompt growth in a person. You have to attend to it in that way. And I think, I think that's a great, amazing example. Uh, what you've done and you've the fact that you're willing to share it online gives every because we we have a dearth of good examples and the fact that you're willing to share this online put yourself out there make yourself vulnerable like this like kudos to you and thanks to you on behalf of the i hear from scores of people who talk about you and how much your story encourages them and so i just on, on behalf of all of them i just want to say thanks to you mm -hmm for sharing this story because I think a lot of people are helped by it. Well, thank you. It's, it, you know, it's risky. It is. <laughs> I'm, it is. But I think at this point, how the Lord can use it in people's lives outweighs my fears. I, I'm fine, you know? Um, so thanks. That's really encouraging. And, um, I'm glad you at least see the genuineness that I feel like I want people to see in me. You know, I, I'm not seeking revenge or acting like a victim, you know? Yeah. I'm not to look. I feel like I'm a pretty good judge of character. And when I can see genuineness, it's genuineness is kind of hard to spot, especially, especially among Christians, oddly enough. And so, I mean, you're the real deal. <laughs> so that's is very refreshing and very very interesting. I feel I feel like the the church that did not get along so well with you really missed a huge opportunity to be provoked into some great edification if they would just stick around mm -hmm. or let you stick around or keep hanging out with you. So do you feel like there's any parts of the story? I have some super chats on standby here to read. Uh, do you think there's mm -hmm. any parts of the story that um you didn't emphasize enough, didn't get to tell that kind of thing. No. Nope. I think I said everything. I did just want to say that the church, did I say this already? The church goes beyond four walls and goes across the world and into eternity. <laughs> and yeah. it is ridiculous to only hang out with, make time for, invest in, love people that gather at your building on Sunday morning. You're missing yeah. out. You're, You're missing out. Camp. I'm sorry, I mean to interrupt you. Oh no, that's fine. That's all. <laughs> forget, mm -hmm. forget my mic is on sometimes. Um, I'm gonna read a few chats here that I have pinned. I pinned a few super chats. So JP says, How is Calvinism not another gospel? More Christians should start calling this out. It's another Jesus who didn't die for all. Love you both. And so I guess I'll stab at this one first. I, I think the data of Calvinism is is different because in Calvinism, if you are elect, then you can you're going to be saved no matter what. If you're not elect, you're not going to be saved no matter what. In 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 the Bible, the good news, according to Paul in First Corinthians 15, is 
Jesus died for our sins according to Scripture, and he was buried and he rose again the third day according to Scripture. If Calvinism is true, that's not good news. Because if you're elect, you're already, your destiny is already sealed. That's just information. If you're not elect, that does nothing for you. So if Calvinism is true, what the Bible calls good news stops being good news. It's just information. And if Calvinism is true, the only good news you could find out would be that you are elect. That's the only thing that would be good news to find out. Right. Uh, so yeah, it is a different gospel, but the people who really concern me about this are the ones who say Calvinism is the gospel. Um, Calvinism <laughs> is the gospel and nothing more, that kind of thing like that. That's where, you know, I'm not, I'm not, like I said earlier, I'm not the kind of person who's saying who's saved and who's not, but those are the guys that like really stand out to me as bizarre. <laughs> mm -hmm. I saw a meme today. It showed, uh, you know, the Tom Hanks movie with Captain Phillips and the the mm -hmm. pirate comes in and says, I'm the captain. Look at me. I'm the captain now. But he's dressed up like John Calvin and it and Captain Phillips is 1500 years of church history. And then John John Calvin goes, look at me. I'm the gospel now. <laughs> I saw that today. <laughs> <laughs> that was hilarious. I don't know if you have any comments on this. I mean, I just think of Galatians again. Um, he says, I've heard that some have come with an, another gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but, you know, it, it's there is the the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. And there is no other good news of Jesus Christ. That is the accurate good news of Jesus Christ. And so I do think Calvinism maligns the work of Christ because they say he only died for some. And it maligns the good news because it's only for some. Um, I guess when I think of the word gospel meaning good news, it's it, it just makes it less tricky in my head. And I don't get so caught up in that uh, because I'm not trying to figure out who's believing the right thing and who's not. I, I just want to encourage us to read the word and believe take it at its word, take the Lord at his word and let it be our authority. Even if it means giving up man-made doctrine, like it's okay. You're, yeah. You know. Um, yeah. The Bible's still there. If we give up man-made doctrine, I got these mm -hmm. uh, theology books right in front of me. I could throw them all in the fire right now. And the Bible still be there. The next super chat is right along. I think you already just answered it. Cause you just referred to Galatians anyway. Um, Iron sharpens iron says Galatians 1 8 tulip is a false gospel. Any thoughts on this? So I think we just covered that. Thanks for the super chat. And um, Ion Tactics says, Do you both, this is interesting, do you both think it's harmful to not treat Calvinism as a false religion like Mormonism or JW's? If so, in what ways is it harmful? Um, do you want to talk about that first? Or you want me to talk about it first? I'll say uh, short. I maybe this is where you're going to go with this too. At least Mormonism and Jehovah's Witness are up front. If a Calvinist church is up front, mm -hmm. then you know that is that's how it should be. If they're not up front, if they're hiding behind the scenes, if they're only presenting these things in a smaller group, a Sunday school, or in a smaller to a smaller group of people, there's a problem. If this is the truth, they should be able to, you know, preach it every Sunday with no problem, no, no shrinking back from the pulpit to every age and every person with no problem. But that is not what happens. There is deliberate um, word choices and slow introduction because it is heavy and hard to swallow. And if they gave it all to you at once, no one would take it. That's true. So it's, I think it's harmful to not call that part out. That needs to be called out, that they need to be more upfront. Just say the truth, uh, like the Honest Calvinist uh, Conference that I would kill it, put together. That's, that's yeah. how they need to sound. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we should put in a plug for that. Y'all go check out Idol Killer's oh, uh, Honest Calvinist videos. It is epic. I love those things. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> So, yeah, so I will I will completely echo what you're saying there. Like a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon will come up to you and they're like, "Hey, 
basically what they're saying is you're a Baptist. We disagree with you. We think you're wrong and we think we're right. Come to our church because we're right. So they're mm -hmm. honest that there's a difference and we're mm -hmm. teaching something different. Calvinism comes in stealth and it tries to present everything as if it's the same as yours. Like you'll take a phrase that we both agree on, like faith, uh, salvation is not by works, for example. Everybody, nobody has a problem with that. But then they will, they mean something different by that. That you will find out later, months later, many times, that what they mean by that is salvation is not by faith because they try to make faith a work. And if you're saved, with faith, you know, if, if Romans 5 2 is correct, then you're a Pelagian. <laughs> you know, if by, mm -hmm. if we enter, if by, we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, mm -hmm. uh, if you believe that, you're a Pelagian to them. And you believe in works salvation, even though he just said it's not by works anyway. So mm -hmm. there's that whole component where they're, they use equivocation, they use word games, they're sneaky, they try to present themselves as a deeper version of what. Christianity is, um, whereas they should have their own place. You know, the, the Presbyterian denomination is is where they belong. But yeah, I do, I do think they have several things in common. They they have the wrong Christology. They have the wrong Christ. Uh, it's it it is. But but to be fair, at the same time, and I may lose people with my little word salad I'm about to throw out there, but <laughs> any propositionally normative ideology has the same set of problems and Calvinism doesn't matter if it's Calvinism doesn't matter if it's free grace provisionism I was an independent Baptist I mean it's like uh you have the whole Wayne Grudem thing these this is my this is my thing this is my correctly arranged set of, uh, that is a, a set of propositions. Here's what we think is true. Here's our truth claims. And we have arranged them into an ideology. And your job is to subscribe to the ideology. And then and then you identify with it. So any any system that does that. And I was an independent Baptist. Mm -hmm. We were doing that. The Calvinists of the church you left, they're doing that. The uh, any, any kind. Yeah. So it's, it's a problem. At the, but at the same time, it is a stage of development that everyone has to go through. And a lot of people just never come out. And if people don't come out of that by the age of 40, statistically, according to Fowler, they probably never will. And that's, wow. that's what makes it so imperative for me to try to provide growth and transformation content. to prov So when people are where you are, like I've definitely... I'm done with this stage three scaffolding over here. What's next? There's nobody out there laying out the scaffolding for what's next so they can keep growing. And then they do things like Tyler, Ve Tyler Vela or Paul Maxwell. Like, well, I guess I'm not a Christian anymore. I'm like, no, you, you mm -hmm. can still be a Christian. There's just no more. This church is not sufficient for you anymore. That, that kind of thing. He asks at the end there, in what ways is it harmful? I mean... I've heard so many different different examples of how people have been harmed by Calvinism. So many. Some feel like life is purposeless. Some feel like prayer is pointless. Some feel like they're petrified all the time, wondering if they're elect or not, um, or if their children are elect or not. Some people think, um, what else have I heard? Just some bizarre stuff. I didn't deal with it. Thank the Lord. Some people use the sovereignty as kind of just an excuse to um, not necessarily keep sinning, but not really give much intentionality to their life. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. God has it all mapped out anyway. So whatever's going to happen, you know, it's really interesting to hear the different ways that people internalize this system. And even if it sounds bizarre, some people actually say, I don't need to share the gospel anymore. Like they really do come to that conclusion. So not everyone does, but many different ways um, have I heard this doctrine affect people. And I think it's harmful. Yeah. I've, when it comes to prayer and evangelism, 
I always say that Calvinists, there, there's no performative reason to do either one of those in Calvinism. There's no reason to do those mm -hmm. if the ideology is consistent. And the only reason Calvinists promote those behaviors is so is to convince the other Christians that they're also Christian. Mm -hmm. yeah. In Calvinism, it's a performative contradiction to do either one of those. Um, Samuel says, uh, it seems like being a Calvinist is difficult to be open-minded. And so the first thing you're going to get from a kickback from that is people are going to, well, you don't need to be open minded. You need to be close. But yes, I, mm -hmm. if, if you subscribe to something like this, or you have a statement of faith, like the London Baptist confession or something like that, that you, in order to be a member of the group, you have to sign that you agree to those doctrines. You just stop being closed minded. And now when you interpret scripture, you're no longer to open to all the possibilities that it can mean. You must interpret. You must drive every passage to a conclusion that matches Calvinism. You must do that with every passage. So the passages are in Scripture even are no longer able to say anything to you. They can only say Calvinism to you. And if they don't say Calvinism to you, you must twist them until they do. That's that's a horrible way to be. Mm my friend you met lisa kevin um she posted yeah. an rc Sproul quote on facebook the other day and it said something it said something that called god our supreme enemy and the conversation was long <laughs> um but it was so interesting how people immediately were like no no he doesn't mean god when clearly when you read the quote he means god and then once people found out he did mean God. It was all about trying to make, try to try to get the context so that we pretty much, we can't disagree with Sproul. If he said it, it's gotta be right. How can we make this work? Instead of, I disagree with Sproul. <laughs> He's wrong in saying that God's our supreme enemy. No one would get to there. Instead it's paragraphs of why he meant it this way. And you know, maybe it's not wrong because of this. There's a bunch of technical debt. This guy. And mm -hmm. yeah, in in software development, they call that technical debt. It's where when you have a bad code somewhere, instead of going back and building from the ground up and fixing that code, you keep you keep patching the code with you know band-aids. And then pretty soon your your code for your software is very clunky. It's too bulky. There's it there's too much processing that has to happen in order for get to the to the root of what's trying to be said and mm -hmm. that's calvinism is is just mm. centuries of technical debt oh my goodness that's like a perfect perfect description i feel like that's what facebook and maybe even person face to face conversation it's like do you want to understand where i'm coming from cuz we're going everywhere except here like it's so it feels hopeless and impossible and and such a like pointless to talk but it's not because look at me and and other people yeah, that yeah. when you talk to them you, you can actually you know <laughs> get in there but man you, it takes dedication to go on and on because i feel like forget this i want to get out of this conversation you know yeah yeah definitely. hey elaine my friend Elaine is here. <laughs> oh, there she is. Oh, that was a different one. Um, we'll watch later dropping by to say hi. <laughs> hey, Elaine. Good to see you. We met her in person, too. So um, we're out of Super Chats. Is there anything you want to say to wrap up um, this session? Any lasting impression you want to leave folks with? You went silent. You may be on mute. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Just to repeat what I said before, my motive. <laughs> my motive is to just minister to anyone that might be in a similar situation and just encourage you that if you stay soft-hearted, if you stay with a clear conscience before the Lord, he is going to carry you through it and you're going to, he's going to heal you, your heart. And yes, of course, there's always going to be sadness attached to this experience, but you're not always going to be brokenhearted every day. Mm -hmm. It's going to be all right. 
And, um, and the Lord is at work. You just never know 10, 20 years down the road, what might come, you know, um, not that I have any unforgiveness for anyone, but if anyone ever did come and apologize to me, which no one has to date, I've already yeah. forgiven them, but I will be kind to them and receive them with love. Um, yeah. And I think that's what pleases the Lord most is to have your heart in the right place. Um, even though the temptation is to protect yourself and just bash everything, you know, that's, yeah, that's Not right. Healthy. <laughs> um, so that would be my closing, just reminder and encouragement and clarifying my motive. Cause I know that can get twisted and somebody said I was trying to make money, which is so stupid. <laughs> I'm trying to make money. I'm going to get rich right here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is not the way to do it. <laughs> oh, good grief. Um, Jaina wants to know what your YouTube channel is so she can follow you. Uh, Alana L. Just my name. L. My name should be there. Alana L. Mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah. Go follow Alana at the YouTube channel, Alana L. And, uh, there's all kinds of content there. Like I learned how to make sourdough bread the other day. <laughs> <laughs> so, it was a process. <laughs> so yeah, uh, be sure to follow Alana. Well, Alana, I'm pleased to death, privileged and honored that um, you came to share your story here with this audience. Um, just thank you. Thank you for your example and perseverance in the faith and for coming on and sharing that story with us here. Thank you. You helped me. It would have been so much harder alone. So I appreciate <laughs> I appreciate you. So thanks. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching. May the Lord bless.